can't see her, but I'll let Jeanette introduce herself. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeanette Beer. I'm a smoking in pregnancy support worker at UHD. Um, I've been in this advisor role for about the last 12, uh, 10 months, um, but was involved in collating smoking in pregnancy data and working on quality improvement projects before that. And today we're both going to be talking to you um, for the next sort of 15 minutes or so around access to nicotine replacement treatment and what does a maternity pathway look like. Next slide. So this is our in-house uh, smoking in pregnancy team uh, who offer quit support for over 400 women and their household members. Um, Martin there is the tobacco dependency programme lead and has been doing a great job of managing us whilst Beth, our public health midwife, has been on maternity leave but has happily returned to us the, the last week. Um, and then we've got Sam there. Sam is the band six smoking and pregnancy midwife. She's got a, she's got a caseload of women and household members um, and she's had responsibility for submitting various smoking audits, reviewing policies with Martin. Um, and as well as undertaking training with midwives and maternity support workers on smoking related projects. And then finally, you've got Vicky, and, finally, you've got Vicky, Vicky and myself there. Vicky myself. We are the band for smoking and pregnancy advisors. Pregnancy bring Paul, Bournemouth and Christchurch, which are quite rural areas actually. So there's a lot of traveling out that, that we have to do to, to do the home visits. Uh, we've been in the, this role, as I say, for about the last 10 months or so. Uh, and we each have a caseload of around about 70 women. So that includes following up referrals, as well as clients who are actually on a quit programme. And we also provide smoking and pregnancy updates to maternity support workers um, and also liaise with our community midwives just to keep them up to date with what's going on with their women. Thanks, Jeanette. Next. Next slide. Yeah. So um, I thought it would be helpful just to give you a little bit of background as to where we were back in 2015 when we first established um, our in-house smoking and pregnancy service and had to look at all the things that were needed um, to roll that service out, which one of them, which was a biggie, was our protocol to issue NRT. So if you can just hold the blue boxes for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we were really fortunate that we have funding for four years from Public Health Dorset and um, they not only funded the service but also the nicotine replacement therapy for the pregnant women. Next blue box. So um, each trust received around about 10 to 15 thousand pounds per year which was enough but to be fair when we first started we had no idea how much money we were going to need to cover the cost of NRT but it was just enough to provide that direct supply of NRT to the pregnant smoker. Next blue box. Um, I think it's probably fair to say back in 2015, there wasn't an awful lot of um, information out there on NRT protocols, on sort of that in-house offer. And we did quite a bit of um, scoping work around the country to see what other in-house services we're using. And we based our Dorset protocol on a protocol that we got from Scotland um, and we use that as the basis with their permission to write our Dorset NRT protocol. And we also needed to understand what, what the evidence and the research was around midwives given direct supply of NRT. So when we first established as a team, we were all band six smoking and pregnancy midwives. There were three of us. I was one of them. Um, we needed to learn about this being a general sales licensed product. And that it didn't need a PGD, it could be a protocol. Um, so yeah, we, we had to learn what the law said around midwives doing this. Next blue box. We also needed to understand what was the safe storage requirements for nicotine replacement therapy, which was very much a double locked system. So when we actually first had our first stock arrive, which was massive because we over ordered, again, because we didn't quite know how much we needed, um, it was important that it was in a locked treatment um, cupboard in a locked treatment room. And in the early days, um, sort of during that pilot, we very much saw all our pregnant women at home. So we had to learn around safe storage out in the community, which was, again, similar, um, you know, a locked bag in our locked car. And we had to make sure that the room, um, that the stock was at room temperature, which uh, was challenging. I, will, I won't lie, it was challenging during summer months to make sure that the stock didn't go over 24 degrees. Next box. 
And I, I guess for me, I cannot emphasize how important pharmacy involvement is. And they were involved right back at the very start when we were first establishing our service. They helped us draft our first NRT protocol, the amount of different drafts that went between us, um, the smoking and pregnancy midwives and the, our pharmacy team to make sure that we got this right. And also, you know, I'd never put a um, protocol, a medicine protocol through ratification before. I, This was all new for me as a smoking and pregnancy midwife. Had no idea what was involved. I didn't even know what a drugs and therapy committee was. Um, and pharmacy were really good at supporting me with that protocol going through. And I'm I'm not sure if any of you have put a protocol through, but you present your protocol to a board. They do have the opportunity to read it prior to the board meeting. And they do sort of unpick it, really, and um, add bits and take bits out and ask lots of questions, which you then go away and make those changes and resubmit. So it's quite a timely process, but pharmacy are great at supporting you through that process. Next box. And like I said, we were brand new smoking in pregnancy midwives and we'd never given out nicotine replacement therapy before as midwives, um, you know, as part of our job. So we had to learn about this medication. What was nicotine replacement therapy? How did it work? What are the different products? The, you know, the fast acting, the long acting, what were the doses? Um, what were the drug interactions? And also, you know, there are exclusion and caution criteria to NRT. What were they? Um, what did we do if a pregnant smoker did hit a caution criteria? Who did we talk to? What was the governance process behind that? And obviously all that information was added into our protocol. Next box. And it was really important for us back at the start when we were looking at our in-house service, that we wanted to eliminate as many barriers as possible to getting the NRT to the pregnant smoker as quick as possible, which is why we wanted to go for direct supply. Um, and we decided that we were gonna give three weeks supply at one time, even though we were seeing, certainly in the early days of, of her quit, her regularly, uh, with this particular cohort of patient, they did tend to mess us around a little bit with appointments. They might not have been at home when we were planning to see them. And it may be a couple of weeks go by before we could um, get another appointment with them. We didn't want them to run out and risk relapse. So we made sure that we could give enough stock to prevent that. Next box. And then last, but no, but by no means least on this slide was how important it was to evaluate this work. We needed to understand out of all the referrals coming through, how many of the women engaged wanted to use nicotine replacement therapy? Uh, what was the most popular choice? And certainly during the four year pilot, the most popular choice was a patch alongside the inhalator for the pregnant cohort. We needed to understand how much we were spending on nicotine replacement therapy. And we were averaging around about 180 pounds per quit in the early days. Um, we needed to know how long was the average length of time a mother used nicotine replacement therapy during her quit. And again, in the early days, that was around seven to eight weeks. So all that was really important information for us to put into a business case to look for more funding to continue post the pilot. Next slide. So in um, 2019, uh, the pilot had finished uh, and we were now looking at what we could do to extend the service. Next box, please. So funding, we saw ongoing funding continue from Public Health Dorset, but this was extended now to include NRT for partners and household members, and also the provision of vapes on there. Next box, please. Evidence, we scoped around England at that time to see what was already uh, in use for partners as part of an in-house smoking and pregnancy service. But at that time in 2019, uh, there wasn't an awful lot available um, to us for us to, uh, to have a look at. Um, we also had to research with looking at, at bringing in the vapes, what was being said about the risks and relative benefits of e-cigarettes in pregnancy. So for that, we were referring to things, reports such as those from ASH and other national bodies um, at that time. And with regard to partner quits, Champix at that time was supplied to partners by the smoking and pregnancy midwives under a PGD, um, as it was a prescription only med medication. Um, and as this is now currently available, um, we now offer our partners at this time 
uh, the same NRT products as we do to the women. So we're looking at patches, gums, vapes, etc. Next box, please. So just a little bit there on the research, actually, as we moved to consider using band four advisors, we also had to look out there and check out what was happening in terms of whether we had the ability to give a direct supply of NRT. Um, and as unregistered staff, what we found out was that products could be distributed by unregistered staff, but only by adhering to certain protocols around location. So, for example, we were able to give them out on hospital premises or community hubs, but certainly not out in, in homes, which was where a lot of our work was being done. Pharmacy, as with NRT that Heidi's just described, the pharmacy supported us to adapt the current protocols that we had um, to now include the direct supply uh, to partners. Um, and they also had oversight with regard to including vapes into the same protocols as well. They also were involved, next slide please, next, next um, box please, um, the posting of NRT. So, this was basically a new standard operating procedure that we created with their support. And this is originally put in place um, um, as a result of the constraints of face-to-face -face appointments during the COVID period, um, but still continues to this day, to be honest, an, an essential um, method for unregistered staff, such as myself, uh, to be able to get NRT out to women and their household members. Next box, please. So as our service evolved to include vapes, we had to consider brands, flavors, nicotine strengths to be added to the protocol. And we recognized very quickly that getting the strength and the flavors right are key ingredients for a successful quit. It's amazing the amount of women that will say, oh, you know, I've relapsed, I had one because I ran out of my vape or I didn't like the flavor that you had, you know. So it's really important we get that right for them. Next box, please. In terms of storage, it's really important to get your fire officer involved at an early stage. Um, the lithium batteries in the vapes um, meant that we needed to store them not in the main hospital building, but in one of our satellite buildings. And obviously safe storage, um, as with the NRT, needs to be lo lockable cabinets, etc. Next slide, please. Training, really key. It's really important that our team had the latest product knowledge available. Um, and that we were able to distribute patient information leaflets to our pregnant smokers, especially at that time in those early days in 2019, there was a lot of misinformation around uh, vaping. So it was really important we got those messages out. And to support that, another element um, that was really important to us was to inform the community midwives about the risks and relative benefits of vaping compared to tobacco. Um, and this was achieved through mandatory updates, posters and general sort of huddles and, and getting that information out there to them as well so they could pass it on to the women. Next slide, please. The uh, next box. So continual evaluation of the service, just with the NRT, we needed to keep reviewing that the products available um, that we have, make sure that they're, they're critical in, in ensuring that we're providing a service that meets the needs of the clients, delivers successful quits, whilst at the same time being cost effective. That bottom line is always ever present and it's really important that we had a service that meets all those objectives. So what this involved us doing was regularly reviewing and analysing the cost of the 12 weeks quits, which on average is around about £140 to provide vapes and patches for that 12 weeks, um, which is around about £40 less than the, if you're using combination therapy alone. It's also useful to ascertain which types of products um, that contribute to a successful quit. For example, were people using refillable tanks more successful at quitting than those on the disposable? And Heidi will cover that a little bit in, in a while. We were also you know, starting to consider using other um, metrics to assess the, um, the results uh, of access to our quit program using publicly available data. So census and deprivation scores. For example, you know, we've identified just by looking at our geographical areas that we're covering, that we have a particularly high concentration of smokers that might be better served by more local measures. So putting on more weekly clinics in, in areas where you know, people, people can get to easier. What we've identified is a lot of the bus routes don't really cover from those areas. So if we can go to the women, then they're more likely to access it. 
So I think overall, our outcomes have shown us that what we're doing is we're saving money whilst achieving more quits using these new products. So they really are having an impact. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jeanette. So I'm just going to touch on a little bit of data. Um, it was last year when we introduced direct supply vapes into our in-house NRT offer. So the data is from last October when we went live up until June this year. And 96% of our clients chose a vape as part of their nicotine replacement therapy during our quit program. And that was both pregnant mothers and household members. And the most popular flavours were the fruit flavours, the mango ice, the watermelon ice, the red crush and the sour blue raz. Like Jeanette said, um, the average NRT quit costs with the long acting patch and the vape were coming in at around about £140 per quit. But as you can see on that table below, um, the style of vapes offered a high proportion of our clients did choose for a disposable single use, which are more expensive in the long run. But the most popular um, for our 89 clients was a rechargeable pod type device, followed very closely by the single disposable um, single use disposable device. And actually, it was our younger population of pregnant smokers, so 18 to sort of early 20s, that tended to opt for the disposable. And then the least popular was our refillable tanks. And then you can see um, in terms of successful quit rates, both at four and 12 weeks, the disposable single use actually came out highest in terms of quit outcomes. Next slide, thank you. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the feedback that we've had so far to introduce in these vapes. So first comment there, I love the choice and the variety. Again, you know, as I mentioned, you know, people are on the, these quit programs for a long time and, you know, they will vary in, in what they want. So one week they'll like strawberry kiwi the next week. Oh, I'm fed up of that. I want to have mango ice. So, you know, again, I think one of the key things is keeping a, an eye on that and, and the influence um, that that has on the effect that has on your stock levels. So making sure that, you know, you can predict to a certain degree, but you've got to make sure that you've, you've got enough in there. I wouldn't have agreed to a quit program without them. You know, there's a there's a lot of uh, people out there who are currently vaping as well as smoking tobacco. So I think one of the key things is having something that they're familiar with already and having a device that they're used to um, is encourages the, the more they feel uh, more able to join the quit program because it's not quite so scary. It's not something that's unknown to them. So they're already familiar with that device. So that's really helpful. Um, I didn't want to stop smoking, but it's been OK using my vape. You know, again, you know, we know there are a, a cohort of, of people out there and women out there who, you know, they enjoy smoking. You know, some of them say they get they get pleasure from it. They enjoy it. They don't really want to give it up. But equally, the guilt, the risks that have been explained to them mean that they know that they, they have to. So, you know, we want to, again, doing something that they're a little bit more familiar with. Um, they, as I say, they may already be vaping, in which case, you know, we want to make sure that they're still socially included, you know, going out and vaping with colleagues at work, et cetera, is still an, an important social aspect of, of their, the process. So if we can keep that going, you know, the vape seems to have really worked. And household members, I wouldn't have supported my other half if I couldn't have used a vape. We know how important and the influence that household members have in, in quitting. And again, if they're familiar already with, with a device, um, then, you know, they're more likely to join the quit program. I had a, a, a lady who was struggling on her own, in all honesty, to um, yeah, keep going with her quit. Um, we've recruited her partner to that. And together, they've now been uh, smoke free for the last five weeks since their quit day. So a really good result there and, and shows the importance that household members do have on the women. So I think overall, from our point of view, to just to sort of summarize, what we're seeing is that vapes do appear to, to be more effective than NRT alone for quitting during pregnancy um, and just as safe. So a really good result from our point of view. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. And I just wanted to quickly add, so in Dorset now we have um, two maternity trucks. We've gone from three as part of a merger down to two. And our other maternity trust has just had their NRT um, added into their protocol, which has been ratified and they'll be going live very soon with the vape offer. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Jane now as facilitator just to go through the next couple of slides, I think. 
Oh, thanks, Heidi. Thanks, both for a brilliant presentation. I think it's obviously, Matt's obviously touched on this, and we're going to move into our discussion session. But obviously, you know, from everybody in the room, we're all here on the same page, aren't we? Well, we all want to work together to reduce the harm from tobacco to our pregnant women and families. Uh, we want the best for patients. And obviously, I think the challenge, and everybody keeps saying it, there's lots of myth busting, I think it goes back to Julia's comment before as well, in that, you know, how do we get people on board? We've got to, you know, get around some of the myth busting there. So I think really important that we kind of disagree well if we want to in the room, ask questions, kind of get a deeper understanding of one another's thoughts and values around some of this. Uh, and obviously, if you need to summarise anything and come back, but I think just being open to that challenge, being open to new information, being open to one another's opinions is really, really important. Thanks, Heidi. Just to say, obviously, John's put a couple of links in the chat, which is brilliant as well. So around some of those materials that you can pick up from Ash, uh, which is great. Obviously, we've got the Chris Whitty um, information on vaping. I think it's really clear we're talking around vaping is a quit aid uh, would you know to support those who are stopping smoking so the new swap to stopping if your tip is out and i can see there's lots of local authorities going to be bidding for that really important for those of you on the call from a trust perspective that you're linking in with your tobacco commissioner to make sure you're included in that as well but brill so i've seen a bit of a question in the chat for you, one of you for you guys and it says has the engagement rate for women increased since you're offering the vape option and do you have any information that you give to women are the safety aspects and myths of providing vapes Jeanette, is that something you want to come in with yeah i think you know what we've seen is we have seen a really good engagement rate you know obviously we get referrals in from our community midwives we then make those um, I have those conversations with the women uh, explaining what our service is. And, and I think it's really important as part of that conversation, you know, part of what you were talking about, Jane, there about the, the myth busting there. That's really important as part of that conversation to explain, you know, what what the stance is with re with regards to current research on the vaping. And it's it's quite enlightening how people will really, you know, be quite surprised. They really haven't got a clue about either the risks of tobacco which is obviously another key message that we're getting across to them but also you know in terms of the vaping so you know a lot of them have had negative people commenting saying oh you shouldn't be vaping you're pregnant you shouldn't be vaping so again if we can get across some of those messages to them that's that's been really key and i think it has certainly had an impact on on our engagement rates you know we i think you know we, we're getting up to sort of 89 percent you know in terms of actually sort of getting people to sort of have the conversations with us. And then from there, you know, the, the, the actual people who then sign up to join onto the quit programs is, is really is really good as well, you know, so a good number. Thanks, Jeanette. And obviously for us in GM, we've just gone wide with a vape offering all our maternity units. And I think we're really seeing that increase in quit rates coming through. And I think it gives you that confidence to have that conversation, doesn't it, when you've got devices that you trust and you know they're being provided in the right way. So that's really good. I'm going to come to another conversation and the question in the chat. My cat chat keeps jumping up and down. So I'm sorry, everybody. It kind of takes me back up to the top. Um, where am I? So are vapes always provided in combination with a patch or not? So I'm happy to answer this one, Jeanette. Yeah. So um, combination NRT, and I'm including vapes as NRT, are, it's always encouraged, absolutely. But no, some um, some of our clients just want the vape and not a patch. And also what we have seen is the patch is the first to be dropped. So when we do start them on combination um, NRT, even though we're encouraging use throughout that whole, for as long as they need it, um, it's usually the patch that they will drop and then just continue with the vape. Brill, thanks, Heidi. I'm just going to, before I go in and keep looking in the chat, has anybody got a physical question in the room? So anybody who wants to come in and ask something? I can't see any hands up. Are you coming in there, Jodie? Um, yes, please. So where I'm from Wales and we don't offer vaping at all. Um, we are guidance is only kind of just... Um, recommending that we just discuss the uses of vapes with our patients so it's really really interesting to hear everything that you're saying because we're still waiting for guidance from our um government with regards to what we can offer around vaping in pregnancy um so it's just really really interesting to hear what you're all saying about how well it's working and um it will be something that i'll hopefully be able to take back to everybody about this particular subject because it's still 
um, a lot of, like you say, negative press around it in Wales at the moment. Thanks, Jodie. Um, I'm going to sound really silly now, but um, there is a statement by the Royal College of Midwives, and between us, I'm sure one of us can share it in the chat, which is a really supportive mm -hmm. statement on um, pregnant women being supported to use vapes. But I'm assuming in Wales, we are all under the same Royal College of Midwives, aren't we? So that statement would work. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a rep for the LTM. So absolutely. Yeah. So that's really so, helped for me yeah, to be so, able to take that forward. That, that might be something that John's got to hand. Sorry, say that again. So unfortunately, we're very much governed by the Welsh government on that and their guidelines. So everything that we do here is very much got to be even though we're under the RCM the same as you we can't take anything like that forward without their say so uh, okay um, and I'm sure in that probably comes a lot of things to do with budgets etc um, and we have some big problems with very small budgets in Wales unfortunately but thank you for pointing oh. that out because I'll go have a look at that and um, see if there's anything I can do with that with regards to showing it so yeah, everybody who Thanks. needs to know about it Thanks, Jodie. I think John's dropped that in the chat, the RCM statements. So that's something you can take away. And obviously, if you need any support, we're more than happy to do that, you know, from Heidi and the national team's perspective or any work done more locally as well. Oh, yeah, no, we appreciate the challenges that you experience. And I think it takes a lot of time, doesn't it, to get this over the line. So it's just small steps and keep moving forward. Is there anybody else with a question in the room? Hi, yeah. this is this is Rona and Danielle in Northern Ireland, and we are guided by the Public Health Agency, and we do not, under any circumstances, recommend a vape. That is our guidance, that we do not recommend a vape under any circumstances. Mm. It's, just, it's just interesting to hear you talk about it, and I'm yes, just wondering, um, is, is your success rate really good with um, bringing vapes on, we're getting people off tobacco, and... You know, it's just interesting to hear this side of it whenever we're, we're promoting not to be using vapes at all. And When a client says to us about a vape, we have to tell them not to. Mm. Okay. Did you think that's something that potentially could change in the future? We are under storm and so probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a real challenge, isn't it, for you? Yeah. And I think, you know, there's lots of evidence on the pregnancy, not free pregnancy challenge page. You know, obviously there's lots of evidence around there and, and things you can take away to support the art, you know, kind of having those arguments more locally as well. Yeah. And do you know what? A lot of the patients would, or a lot of the clients would like to, move on the vapes from smoking that's the thing about it but it's it's a struggle because we can't recommend them and they think when they tell you oh i'm using a vape they think they're doing a good thing but we have to kind of correct them almost you know saying yeah, no I'm actually not, you shouldn't be so we're kind of we're kinda different uh, well, maybe that's something we can pick up offline and give you some support around, you know, I'm conscious the room is closing shortly, but I think, you know, that's a real challenging position for you to be in. And I think there's quite a lot of learning nationally that we can we can offer to support you guys outside of this space. So um, definitely something we can pick up with you if useful. But please check out all the resources that John's dropping in the chat that you can take away and begin to have some some different conversations as well. Um, and obviously, I think somebody's just put about vaping not allowed on hospital sites. And I think that is a challenge, obviously, as well. So it's kind of managing a, that smoke-free policy within your trust. It's looking at, um, you know, how we can bring vaping into that space as well. And um, there's lots, still a lot of work we're doing in Great Manchester. I'm sure Hyde's had the same challenges across her trust to, to manage that. Because um, I think without vaping in your, in your, in your outside your organisation, that's a real challenge, isn't it, to, to bring that in. Um, and I'm just looking at people just asking Hi, around. Jane, Quick, can right? I just dive in for one second? Course, can, John. Just, just, just on, the, on the vaping point, because I know everyone's really interested. Um, so hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm yeah. John. I'm policy manager at Action on Smoking and Health. Um, and just to say, we're, I said it in the chat, but we're updating our guidance on vaping during pregnancy that's kind of designed to help inform professionals to have these conversations. Um, and that's going to be published like some this side of Christmas and we'll have a, a webinar to accompany that and so we'll circulate that really widely so we can really dive into uh, this stuff in in detail and look at the evidence with everyone thanks thanks John I think that's really important the more evidence we can get together
together a best practice and what we're all doing is absolutely um is well worthwhile so we can't wait for that to come out john great stuff is there anything else really quickly i'm sure we're going to get pulled back into the main room shortly but is there anything anybody wants burningly to ask deborah Sorry, Jeanette, are you wanting to come in? Um, I think um, Deborah's got a question. Deborah, have you got a question? Yes, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, Hi. Nice to see you today. So I was just hearing about from the midwifery perspective. So my name is Deborah. I work as a um, quality and standards advisor for the Royal College of Midwives. So ah. I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I represent the Royal College of Midwives on the ASH Pregnancy um, Smoking in Pregnancy Challenge Group. So I just wanted um, a bit more details. I think we've still got Danielle and, and her colleague here. Um, I think someone mentioned about Wales as well. Um, I don't know if, I just wanted to get a bit more information because obviously to represent um, these groups on those kind of higher level meetings and things. Um, what is the challenge? Like maybe you can speak from a Scottish perspective that is it, for example, you say like the Scottish government. So is it in terms of the guidance that midwives use or what exa exactly is the barrier? Because I think as John has put in the, in the chat, in terms of RCM, the perspective is across all the, the four countries. So I just wanted to get a bit more details um, about that, if you don't mind sharing. Oh, we've only got a few seconds. Got less than a minute. I wonder if oh, maybe, maybe you... something that... Sorry, Deborah, I'm thinking maybe... Sorry, Heidi. Maybe, Deborah, that's something we can pick up outside of this. If we can get a bit some email contacts together, John, we can maybe bring some colleagues together outside of the room with different the different countries and different groups. Does that sound like something we can do? Yeah, yeah, definitely we can follow up with that. Put my email right, in. So. Brilliant. In touch, so, yeah. Thank Thanks, Deborah. And I suppose if anybody wants to contact you directly, you can utilise that. But I think probably it might be helpful if we have more rounded kind of get everybody in the room conversation. That would help. Lovely. Thank you for joining us today and, and being part of that discussion. I think utilising the RCM and its levers will be really useful for us.